Funk I Live with Pookie of Goddesses Media. I am your host and your presenter for Mythological Moments. And this is the Strike First Gaming Show. To the right of me, I met with the CEO himself, Cobra Kai Tone. To the right of him is Dr. B. Galaxy D. And to the left of me is cosplayer extraordinaire King the Boom. And welcome to our presentation. First off, I want to start off with the latest news of the FGC. So it seems like that S and K has teamed up with, uh, let's see here, Guilty Gear, so that is... Uh, Arc System. Thank you, Arc System Works. So SNK teamed up with Arc System Works for Samurai X Guilty Gear to have a character crossover. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the fan community right now is thinking it may be Biken, because Biken and Guilty Gear has a samurai sword and seems like the only logical explanation mm -hmm. to have her cross over into the samurai spirit world. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think about that? Now, Biken is a dope character. I used to use Biken in Guilty Gear 1, and uh, Biken also has these floor mats that when she steps down on the ground, it pops up and you can combo off those. So I really like that character. That'd be a great addition to the game. What about you, Tom? What do you think? To tell, tell you the truth, uh, I am not really versed in SNK that well. Uh, you know, me, it goes all the way back from Fatal Fury and original King of Fighters, everything beyond that, uh, not too much. Some Samurai Showdown, but no Guilty Gear. Sorry, guys. <laughs> are you kidding? Honestly, I would be ecstatic if it was Biken. I There are two waifus I have, and it's Jam and Biken. Mm. And the fact that she is a badass samurai, it would be a perfect fit. But there are many others I've been having conversations with that want it to be Axel because of time travel, and Johnny suits it as well with his whole backstory. So people are just like all over the place about it. Everyone's hype about it. People cannot wait to find out who it is. I personally hope for Biken because I would just love to see her go at it with Haomaru and the rest of the cast. And um, you know, everybody has their favorites. Some people even want May, and I'm mm -hmm. just like, that makes no sense. Why would May? No, stop that. But you know, I'm hoping for Biken like the rest of you know, the most people in the FGC are hoping for. So I'm just really happy that they've done so many Sam Show cross collaborations. I mean, we've got Warden. Um, we've got that really cute bunny girl from, I can't remember the name of the mobile game that she's from, but they this isn't the first time they've done it for Sam Show since Sam Show came out in 2019. But I really like how they're doing these cross collaborations. So good on you, SNK. So, I know that cosplay is one of your four ways. Have you ever cosplayed biking before? I have had so many people for the last, like, 20 years I've been cosplaying begging me to do biking. And in the early days, it was impossible because for me, I would have to go through every detail and, you know, she has one arm. And then the other arm is like a samurai, modern time, like robotic uh, Gatling arm that she uses when she fights. Mm -hmm. So that is going, that to me in my early times of cosplay, that was like really hard prop to make and do, plus everything else she has. Now I would absolutely love to do it, but I mean, I've already done Giovanna, which I love. I still need to make the giant wolf puppet whenever we return back to. Um, live events mm -hmm. so but for now um i would love to cosplay bike in again so but first i gotta do jam i gotta do jam first i want jam to come back hopefully she'll be dlc mm -hmm. and after that yeah well you guys will get your bike in you know That'd you can always nice. help donate too you know it's gonna be like a twelve hundred dollar cosplay to make so Seriously. especially with a gatling arm so we'll see about that Go fund me that one. Yeah, go, go, go fund me, bike and cosplay. There you go, thank you. Well, I look forward to see it actually to make it into fruition and it makes a reality. I hit it. I'm quite sure that um, it will be excellent, as all of your work has been. Thank you. Okay, moving on. So, next on the current news of the FGC, there is the Mortal Kombat 2021 trailer that just recently came out. Mm. I took some time to analyze it myself. I even made uh, a fan reaction, or what I like to call a react to the reaction videos, because normally when I see a trailer, I like to take my time, sleep on it more than once, go back to it, listen to other people's fan reactions of it, and make sure that I don't repeat what somebody else is saying from their trailer, and then mm -hmm. actually zero in on some history and some spiritual references that may have been overlooked. Mm -hmm. And so um, you can find my video out that I did on that on YouTube. Did y'all see the trailer? I did not see the trailer yet. I'm gonna go take a look after this is all done and said. Well, I know, I know you weren't happy with the trailer. 
So is that something you want to get into right now? Just a little bit, because I know you were not um, as pleased as you well, wanted to be. So I, I was upset about uh, some things that weren't really typically talked about. I know that the major FGC was talking about Johnny Cage being missing. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that Melina's teeth was incorrect, incorrect and yeah. it looked hard cotton. Mm -hmm. But what I saw was something different. One was Sonya Blade wasn't as clairvoyant as she is now. Mm. She didn't have a knowledge of intergalactic realms. She didn't understand that there were other planetary systems. She mm -hmm. was educated by Raiden. In fact, she was so blinded with rage and hate against Kano mm -hmm. that Kano was used as the bait from Shang Tsung to lure her into Outworld mm. because he felt she would be easy to beat in a tournament, thus securing the win for Shao Kahn later down the road. Mm. Um, and then, of course, Raiden then educates her you know, about herself and more about what she will become later on in life. Right. Yeah. The second part is, I'm, what I will say that I am happy to see is the legendary battle that everyone wanted to see done properly, which is the Scorpion Sub-Zero match, mm -hmm. which is basically the Ken and Ryu jump off or the Ryu against Akuma battle that most people want to see yeah. in the martial arts gaming community. Mm -hmm. But where the men get their shine, it's not often that the women get their shine and the legendary battle in Mortal Kombat for the female side of thing is the Katana Molina um, mm -hmm. rivalry which sets up the backstory to Mortal Kombat 1 into 2 leading into 3 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so because of that you know I'm not sure if they're going to get their shine because yeah. Molina once again is fighting against Sonya like in Annihilation and they were yes. never rivals. Her female rival didn't come to Mortal Kombat uh, Deadly Alliance and mm. that was Frost. So, okay. So, moving on, there's also another piece of handheld gaming technology that is trying to rival the GPD win and that is the Aya Neo. This is another handheld that's running off of Windows 10. It is given a mobile AMD Risen 5 Let's see, I want to make sure I get these specs right. 16 gigs of RAM, 512 SSD hard drive space with mm. Wi-Fi 6, and a 65-hour um, watt battery. Not sure about 65 hours. Doesn't really sound right. Mm. But to have that Risen uh, dedicated mobile graphics card on a handheld, mm. that's pretty badass knowing that it's running Windows 10 and there's a lot of emulation that can happen. Mm. Like most handhelds now that's coming from China that's utilizing Windows 10, as an operating system platform, it becomes uh, a bit more difficult to get more battery life. It's cool to have that integrated control structure, but as you play these games longer and longer, you know, depending on what type of game you're playing and the, the graphic output and the strength of the game will start to lessen the battery life. Uh, right now, I know that you have the GP Win Max. Uh, how are you liking that handheld device? I actually love it. Um... I get a lot of gameplay off it. I do everything on it, as well as my PC activities from internet and uh, emails and everything, because it is a PC, it's a computer, but it does everything. Plays on my fighting games, uh, Mortal Kombat 11. I haven't tried that much, uh, but everything else, it works for me, from my Virtual Fighter 5, my Street Fighter 5, uh, Dragon Ball Fighter Z. It, it works perfectly. Okay. Well, awesome. So that's it for right now for latest FGC news. I'm going to take it over to Kitty Kaboom, who is going to let us know what's going on <laughs> in her world of cosplay and anime politics. What do you have for us this week? Um, I have a bit of a touchy subject. It's not too touchy, but it's something that needs to be said. And right now, with there being a break in live events and no cosplay conventions, no fighting games, like nothing's going on right now. And it's very, very unfortunate. I know that a lot of conventions are trying to do online presences for all of the conventions. But at this point in time, I would really like to um, focus on preparation for when we go back to those live events. And one thing I just want to talk about is in the past I've noticed that when conventions choose anime or cosplay guests, a lot of times they go for people who are very, very popular on the internet or people who have a high follower count. And when I've run conventions uh, at smaller cons that I was a part of in SoCal or out of state, like uh, New Mexico, I always made sure not to do that. 
You guys are missing a lot of awesome talent and people who are actually genuine about wanting to share their craft at these conventions instead of somebody who is popular just because they're popular or just because they do sexy cosplay. With my research, what I found is that yeah, you can have, you know, a cosplayer who's popular or somebody who calls themselves a cosplayer have over 100k, 200k followers. That's great and all, but when I go and research them, I see that they do nothing but, you know, OnlyFans, softcore porn, mm. or they're going to be a character in a wig, and then next video I see they're showing their butthole to the camera. I wow. don't honestly <laughs> want that. <laughs> being represented at any type of convention I'm doing. And I've noticed this with uh, people who are in marketing for the cons or, you know, they're trying to get special guests either f as cosplay judges or just cosplayers to be there to bring in the people. Mm. Um, my, my advice is, you guys, please do your research. Um, yeah, somebody might have 100,000 or more followers, but... Are they actually going to show up on time? Are they going to want to do panels for you? Do they actually have the knowledge of cosplay and creating to uh, bring what they do with their craft to the community and talk about it and share it with all the other guests there? Like, yes, I do understand you want some top popular cosplayers. That's fine. But for the most part, it's like you got to bring people in who are passionate about it. I've seen some phenomenal friends of mine um, that actually do outstanding props and they even made me a gift. They made my brawly chest armor and then I did the rest of the armor and I did my Saiyan wig. But these two girls are called Haphazard Hatters. Um, they're sisters and they do amazing props. Their detail is phenomenal. And I tried to get them once for a convention and the people in charge were just like, oh, but they only have like 600 followers on Instagram. Like that doesn't matter. They're going to show up. They have all this knowledge. All these kids that are into it now and these newer generations are coming in, they're going to actually answer their questions, sit down and give the vital information that people who pay good money to go to these cons want to actually find. So I always, I was really upset that I couldn't get them for that show but I did help them out later in the future in another show. And it's just like little things like this that can make the whole, um, the whole experience at an anime convention way better where you're gonna continue to get uh, you know, attendees every year because they're gonna wanna come back, not just because there are big flashy names there and they might be able to say hi to them, you know, and instead it's just like kind of focus more on the genuine parts of cosplay and why these people come to these conventions. There is so much unsung talent out there that needs to be represented. And that's one thing that why I like running, uh, you know, cosplay events and anime cons and judging at um, cosplay contests and masquerades because there's no, I try not to have the bias there. You know, you can have a popular cosplayer be a judge or a guest, but did they make their own costume? Did they put the time in it? Was it just a purchased item? Do they actually have experience in the theater? Do they know what they're looking for on stage when people are presenting and performing their craft? So as we're going back 2022, 2023, I would, I would advise just people out there running conventions, look to local, look to who is in the local community, and just actually just do your research because you guys are missing out on some great people who can do panels and run events and actually genuinely help your con survive. So that's it for me. <laughs> well said. I, I definitely empathize with your struggle. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to do something similar like that with the fighting game community by allowing professional cosplayers to get their shine and light at fighting game events. Mm -hmm. I wanted to bring some of the best of Red Bull talents from uh, what is it? They have Red Bull has their hands in a whole bunch of things, but they yeah. specifically have their hands and their talents and martial arts, acrobatics, mm -hmm. um, free running. They do a whole free yeah. running tournament in Europe, and some of the best free runner, free runners, parkour artists, tumblers, martial artists. I wanted to bring some of them in who are actually local to the Bay Area, 
and to bring them into the fighting game community and take their talent, mm. hone it, and kind of shift it into the fighting game community, mm. we can get a live presentation of some of the best fighting game characters do the moves in real life on mm -hmm. stage. Something that I've been doing for a long time. I did it at Fanime, yep. I did it in New York, tumbling and flipping, but now that I'm getting older, I won't be doing a backflip forever. You know, I'm, I'm getting tired now. You know? <laughs> Same. <laughs> you know, I, I miss being in my 20s and, and, and having that energy. So now mm -hmm. I'm trying to bring and create a space where that exists so that, who knows, maybe places like Hollywood and, and other areas like Atlanta, Georgia that have their own mm -hmm. now film studios down there with Tyler Perry mm -hmm. are looking for motion capture artists and um, martial artists and street artists and tumblers and gymnasts they can come to like anime conventions mm -hmm. or, or even fighting game conventions and look at these tournaments for those that are actually competing in a cosplay talent side on a professional industry level so that they can see, you know, what is there and pull from that talent pool and create a wonderful collaboration. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And because not everybody can compete or go to the World Cosplay Summit. And um, for other people, it's just like, especially cosplayers like myself and you who are into fighting games, like, they, I would love for us to be showcased more. Um, I, I actually got to help bring a group of cosplayers together at a fighting game event. It was SoCal Regionals in 2017. I was really fortunate to work with Vi and Jimmy on that because, like, they let me bring in cosplayers to be featured there that were also, you know, martial artists and stuff. And it was, it was a great experience for them, and they really enjoyed being there and I mean that led to doors opening for them too as well which mm -hmm. is one thing that you know we try to do in the community and come together for our community mm -hmm. so I'm with you I can't wait to go back to live events and try to do this more with everybody especially in the FGC too and so. what is your take with, on it? with yes. I, my question was um, is um, with everything going digital and with no live events, how do you get your shine on and how do you get the opportunity to be, you know, when these events come back to actually already have a job or, you know, a signing to be showing up and getting paid to doing this job that, you know, people love to do? Okay, so the getting paid part is something I will cover in another show. Okay. Um, but um, for right now, it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle for a lot of us. Um, if I'm really happy right now that I actually have cosplay because if I didn't, I would be going insane right now. We're almost one full year in to this pandemic, and if I didn't have my hobby, like, I don't know what I would be doing right now. And I'm and keeping my cosplay alive through this pandemic and showing it off on Twitter and stuff and doing videos, uh, Instagram videos, TikTok videos, is the best way everybody's been trying to express themselves. Mm. Um, I did get asked to be a guest uh, early last year while the pandemic was going on for a virtual convention and I just did uh, not want to do it sadly. It just kind of seemed like a headache to me especially if you're not too tech savvy or have the best PC or computer to do that on. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I couldn't give all I could if I would have said yes. And um, I've, I've, I have professional friends who are VOs and actors that have been going and doing these cons and it's kind of been some have said it's been good others have said it's been a bit of a struggle but um now that we're in 2021 and this is still going on and happening everyone's getting used to it now and i i really hope that these conventions can kind of stay alive because i know it's been really hard for them to get like these virtual conventions going but um i mean comic con last year had good praise about it the way they ran things so hopefully people can continue to learn and maybe use san diego comic con as an example for how to run their virtual cons but for now i've got instagram i've got twitter i make videos i'm just trying to have a good old time and keep myself entertained and a lot of other cosplayers are too well thank you kitty thank you we look forward to seeing what you have for us next week <laughs> Moving forward, we're going to take it over to you, Dr. B, Galaxy B. What's uh, happening this week in the world of fashion between Tokyo and America, and what do you have to present to us? Well, it's funny that you ask, Cookie, because 
I got something new for y'all. I always do. You know what I'm saying? It's your boy, Dr. B, a.k.a. Galaxy B, or Dr. Galaxy B. It's all the same. And today's item is we're taking it beyond just the fashion of what we wear. We're taking this to home decor. Oh, boy. Because it's all about the future. And the future is home decor. Because there's nowhere else to be. You got to be at home. You got to be at home. At the end of it. So I got the Billionaire Boys Club pillow. And uh, this pillow is dope. It's from uh, Billionaire Boys Club, which is uh, Pharrell's uh, clothing brand in line. Um, this is a, a limited edition plushy pillow of the astronaut helmet just to get intergalactic with. Throw this up on your couch. You can have it right here, like next to you, like that bam, like your buddy, you know what I'm saying? Or bam, right here on your lap. Boom. And it's just a dope, you know, dope plushy pillow collectible and um, something that's rare but dope to have on your couch. And, um, you know, if you just don't care about it, you can sit on it and you know, do whatever else you want. But I like to have it, like, on the couch or just on display in my room or office. It's pretty dope. So I love this. And it came in three colors, also um, purple with pink uh, threading and also navy blue with a cream threading. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to get the black and white because it's the most universal. Is that the only type of pillow they have in the style of building a boys club? Is there other kinds? Oh, they have all sorts. They have um, the Running Dog uh, pillow, which is by Ice Cream, Billionaire Boys Club. Mm. I would say uh, sister line or, yeah, or, or down line. I wanted would. to touch this. Thank you. Anything soft and squishy and plushy. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. You guys, yes, to. you guys know my weaknesses. Right. So, is this my late birthday present? No, I can't say all that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That coming from directly from the home. Hey, I was just asking. But now that I, I know that you asking. like it, I can keep you in mind. But, okay, um, thank yo, you. Yo, that doesn't run for too much. It um, retails at about $100. You know, it's a super collectible. I love it. Barry and the Boys Club, shout out to Pharrell, Star Trek, NERD, I Am Other, and all that stuff. So. We love y'all, and this is all I got for today, but when I come back next time, I got a little something different from y'all. Okay. I expect this whole place to be furnished Yes. by the time we're done. Well, it should be. <laughs> well, since you know she likes that kind of stuff, you know I want that coach bag, but we'll talk about that later. Oh, right, that's right, 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 off my dead body. <laughs> And, and steal the Chewbacca shoes. I, right. I want to still wear those for me to touch. Right, like, right. You I'll need go. to bring I'll that bring stuff. I'll bring them out. I should have brought them this time. I'll bring them. I'll bring them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Is this a recent release? Or is yeah, just game came game? out. This came out. Um, actually, this came out 2020. Um, I just got at the end of 2020. So they're no longer in circulation. You had to be lucky to get one. Sold out in minutes. Got it, though. It's like got a it. sneaker game. You gotta yeah. be there like right there. <laughs> but I love it. It's like cool stuff like this, kind of like, it's very inspired by Japan. Like Japan, when you go there, the home decor for all the brands is out the window. Like when you come to America, the same stores, they don't have all the same good stuff for the decor. But you go to Japan, it's like, wow. So like last when we were all in Japan on the Strike First Gaming Tour 2019 and 2000. 20 in the beginning of um before the pandemic of course we were able to buy all sorts of like home decor items and like umbrellas pillows and cushions like this um chains and jewelry all sorts of stuff i remember yeah we went crazy i'm starting to learn how paramount it is that if you really want something that's limited edition you have to literally be mm -hmm. there almost an hour mm -hmm. you know while the timer clock on the internet is going down mm -hmm. otherwise you're going to miss it and mm -hmm. you know one thing i just recently missed and it was that Kwamba recent um, limited edition fight oh, stick. Oh, yeah. no. The Chinese New the Year Chinese one. New Year's Only thing. like six made, and wow. you had to be there like right then and, and there I, to I, get I it. Know, oh, man. man. And so I, I, I don't collect fight sticks like that. This mm. is not my thing, but a Chinese New Year stick. It was, it's right. a beautiful stick. I bet you the retail was stick. probably like, what, 400, 500? It was 500. Oh, it was retail was 500? It was like 500. Six made? $500 retail? Yeah, okay. I thought it was going to be, okay, when I saw the stick, and I knew it was going to be sold out, but I was like, I just got to see how much it was. Mm -hmm. And I clicked on it, and I swear it was like $500, and I'm looking like, I expected like 1000 1200 something, you know, because it was so rare. Wow. You know what's so, like, counterproductive to the whole concept that they only produced six of it? Mm -hmm. That I thought they would have done the Chinese way, because eight is the most auspicious number in Chinese culture, and mm. since they had the show, the show symbol, which is the symbol of immortality, longevity, mm -hmm. and life, was in the very epicenter of the stick. The stick went right into the center of the show symbol, mm -hmm. and eight is the auspicious number of infinity, so you would have thought they mm. would have produced eight, right, right, because right. it represents, you know, the duality of all things. So I guess somebody in their culture department got that shit wrong. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> right. Oops. Which Oops. happens often. Maybe, maybe you can ask Kwame to make uh, 
make a couple more. Maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, did you guys see this on eBay on aftermarket after it sold out know, or anything? Oh no. No, but like I'm tempted to look it up right now and find out because yeah, I'm sure somebody is at least like buying it to resell it. Right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would keep that. I would. I too, would keep that because it's absolutely gorgeous stick once again. Is. But yeah. Someone can sell it and get a used car. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's a turbo engine for my FC right there. Wow. Okay, if I flip that, then I can finally get my little snail shell. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure there's somebody. Now, I'm so curious now. After a show, I'm going to go look immediately and find out. So <laughs> that's crazy. We, we'll, we'll let you know later <laughs> if we, if well, we see you. it. Right on. Galaxy B with your presentation this week. Moving over to you, Cobra Kai Tone. What's up in the toy department? Ah, today, today, today. All right. Yes. We oh, have. Yes. Well, before What's we in get the box? into the box, we're going to get into the backstory drop. So mm. today we are talking about Punisher War Machine. So Ooh. you guys know Frank Castle. Frank mm -hmm. Castle, the Punisher. The Punisher. You know, War Machine, who was extra popular because mm -hmm. of the Avengers movie played mm -hmm. by Don Cheadle. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, Punisher gets War Machine's suit and he runs amok. So, I didn't know anything about the story until I really got into the toy, the mm. toy from Hot Toys, and then mm. I got into the comic book, and mm. then reading the comic book, uh, I didn't actually read the comic book, I went on Marvel Unlimited for nine ninety nine, and mm. I read it digitally, and I got my comic books unread and mint condition. So, the backstory is, I don't want to give too much because you yeah, don't want to be a spoiler, but Nick Fury comes at Punisher with a proposition. Uh, you know, Nick Fury and Punisher don't like each other through their history of wars or against each other and past comic book feuds and funks. But uh, Fury, you know, knows his way of tinkering with people. He gets the children involved, like tells Frank Castle that there's children involved. You want to serve some justice. So he's like, all right, I'm down. He gives Punisher access to a suit that he gets to steal from the Avengers headquarters. And it ends up being War Machine's suit. So he goes over to another country, wars, dictators, cleans it up, doesn't get back the suit, comes back home to the big city, ends up killing all the mob bosses, criminals, everything like that. Wow. And, uh, you know, he, Punisher vi vigilante style. Mm. And, uh, there, you know, other comic book heroes, they like what he does, but not exactly what he does. So he ends up getting into funk with some superheroes back in his home city and they relinquish him from the suit sooner or later. But you can catch this all in Punisher. 218, 219. These are very beautiful. The artwork is very nice. 220. And this is him all in this suit. Yes. Okay. That's crazy. It looks sick. Yeah, that actually looks really cool, yes. especially with the, the Punisher skull. With the skull in the front, in the front. yeah, yeah exactly. I'm about to say. Yeah. 222 is very digital. The, the prints are very digital. These things look bad. That's bad. dope, y'all. I don't want to cuss, but you know. You know what I mean. So mm -hmm. it goes all the way to 228. They have variants on these also. I do not have the variants. I got to collect those and also get these things signed so I can CGC them. Mm -hmm. uh, these are all unread copies. Uh, like I said, I went on Marvel Unlimited app for 9.99. You can read almost not everything, but a lot of the prints from Marvel. Mm -hmm. And uh, not have to damage your comic book and leave them unread so you don't get the, you know, the spine ticks and the spine rolls, you know, lower your CGC score and lower your value. So I got into this, love the story, still have not opened this thing yet, but today oh. we're going to somewhat open it. I'm not going to fully open this. I got some good pictures to show you guys, but this is Hot Toys Punisher War Machine. The last uh, Hot Toys I showed you guys was John Wick and that was super bad. So this one... Uh, it's based off the Marvel Future Fight mobile game, which I've never played, but the mobile game is based off the comic book for the Punisher War Machine character, which I thought was cool that they did something for a video game. Video game masterpiece series. So I hope more of these come. But let us get into it, y'all, before I damage the box. <laughs> Help me out, Dr. B. Yes. Nice box. Beautiful box all the way around. This thing has beautiful textures, 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 textures. This is a 1.6, stands about under eight, no, 13 inches tall, 30 points of articulation, which is very good. Um, comes with a lot of pieces. It even comes with an instruction where it's like a model kit, almost like building mm. a Gundam. This thing has a lot of pieces. But we will just unleash a little bit about it. 
Look at that. Beautiful. Even on that, it has the embroidery into the foam, the styrofoam. So let's pop this open. You guys know I'm an inbox collector, so I am actually popping this open for the Whoa. first very time to show you guys. Yes. The head sculpt, very beautiful. Hand painted. The hair, everything. Damage, the shadowing. Comes with the extra helmet. Extra helmet has the LEDs that light up. Nice. Punisher symbol and all the uh, all the weathering from war. He has a Gatling gun that goes on a shoulder, rocket launcher. He has his uh, missiles on his uh, his forearms. He also has diff four different hands, which you can see. And some of those hands have the blasters, which they mm -hmm. also come with the fire effect. So it makes it look like he's flying. Um, this is a very cool toy. 392 retail. Get it before it sells out. Other people will probably be, I think this will go to 500 for sure. This is a very beautiful piece. Uh, one of my first hot toys after I got this one, I was destined to get more hot toys, and ever since then, I've been on a binge. Very expensive hobby, but I love them. So, <laughs> wow. get this before it goes out, and you will be forced to buy it for 500 on eBay, people. Yes, and also, um, if you do want to get into other things and you don't want to spend $392, $400, you can also get the Marvel Legends uh, Punisher War Machine for $24.99. And also the Funko Pop for nine ninety nine. Mm. Yes, oh, guys, wow. get into it. The story's beautiful. If you like Frank Castle and his vigilante style Punisher Justice, see him with this suit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I have for your cookie for today. Oh, in my beautiful collection. Well, I have one question about the pet toy model right there. Mm -hmm. So is that the only version of this right here? Did they ever make like another version? put on side with a collection with this one or it's just standalone this is just standalone by itself this is standalone there's nothing else that goes with this uh as far as the marvel future fights i have i haven't seen anything else in this line uh mm. i have to go digging i don't want to tell you guys anything false there there may be something from the future fight marvel line from the, uh, that mobile game i'm actually going to check the mobile game out too just to see it and play with punisher war machine so you guys might want to do that also as far as you know, do you know if anyone's looking for this particular model? Does this have like a high resale value or is it rare? Tell you the truth, uh, a lot of people don't know about Punisher War Machine. So mm. that's why I wanted to bring it up because, you know, I love Punisher. And I was like, Punisher with a uh, kind of Iron Man suit? What the heck is he going to do with that? How many people are going to kill? He's going to be Rambo with this thing, you know? So uh, not a lot of people ask about it. Um, I think, though, it's going to be one of those jewels in the future that... Since no one's going to ask about it, it's going to get lost in translation, and mm. it won't be circulated around on the aftermarket. So, get one piece! <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us today. Yes. We look forward to seeing what other toys you have in your collectible toy box with us next week. Anytime. All right, and there you have it. And now we're going on to my segment with mythological moments. And so... Uh, we went to Japan to compete in the EVO uh, last year in 2020, at the very beginning. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right before the pandemic hit, and we was able to get back into the States before uh, the pandemic would have kept us there in quarantine, and who knows how long it would have taken for us to leave Japan and come back to America. But while I was there, I engaged myself in one of the tournaments for an old PlayStation 1 fighting game called Advanced Variable Geo 2. It is one of these gem of fighting games that help lay the foundation to what is known as shoujo fighting games. Uh, shoujo fighting games are um, pretty fighter, female, or all female based character martial arts games. So the whole cast is nothing but women. And there's a separate genre, a niche community in Japan. Started out as something like doujin games, mm -hmm. collectible figures, and became something much bigger over time. And the two notable series that really laid down the framework was Asuka Burning Fest and Variable Geo. Mm -hmm. And then from that, you know, years, years later, you have your Akari Hearts, you have your Skull Girls. But what really laid it down was Variable Geo. And it was so good and so popular at the time when it came out from the PC Engine all the way up until 2004 when it had its final game, known as um, VG Neo. So it, was, it ran for 10 years that the cult community for this game really wants another Variable Geo 2 game. Mm -hmm. Now before I get into that, just kind of wanted to give a little bit of the backstory of the history of this game because it's the greatest Street Fighter knockoff you'll ever play. Mm. 
really it's the greatest Street Fighter knockoff you'll ever play. Where the back, the back, the whole background of the story is about these female martial artists that are being sponsored by a conglomerate corporation known as the Johanna Group, mm -hmm. that's basically Shadowloo in this world. And it's being ran by a crazy woman named Miranda Johanna, who's half American, half Japanese. That's your bison of the game. <laughs> who's trying to seek immortality. That's bison. You know, by creating a tournament and then having these martial arts women fight in the tournament, but the way to get them into the tournament is to sponsor them. And by sponsoring them, the incentive is by winning the tournament, you get one billion, one billion yen in your private piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. But they don't realize that once you get to the end of the tournament, you're going to get kidnapped, all this stuff happens. Basically what Street Fighter 2 was, was set in the world of Variable Geo. And you find out that Miranda is dying, and she's trying to create these host bodies for herself by getting herself into these biological experiments. And what she does, she creates these successful clones known as Material. So that's the Juni and Julie of the Variable Geo world, known as Material 1 and Material 2. And the game focuses on the main female protagonist, Yuga Takeuchi, mm -hmm. who is the Ryu of the game, who wants to understand the meaning of battle. And she feels that there's a serious emotional and spiritual connection through martial arts when two fists come together. She's ba basically what Ryu feels. <laughs> And so it sp spans against these two games. Mm -hmm. There's more games, but this is the main game of Advanced VG1 and Advanced VG2, which are the game versions of these three manga right here. These are the three graphic novels to the game. And I mean, they're more novels than graphic. You can pass these around, and it's a really intricate story and goes, re goes really behind the scenes between the conglomerate core of Johanna Group, Miranda, the CEO, how she uses her stepdaughter, Raimi, as a bargaining tool because she's really trying to take over someone else's body spiritually as her company feels that they found a way to transfer her soul into a new body. Basically what you see in the X-Men Apocalypse movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then video game style. These are some other mangas that span on the other stories within the VG universe. And the game collection will continue up until 2004-2005. This is the um, three-episode anime right here. This is a three-episode anime um, that, of course, is based upon the graphic novel. So those three graphic novels mm -hmm. came together in this three-episode OVA. And then, of course, this is the last in the series, which takes place three years so after. Much. So this would be like the third strike of the VG, of the VG series known as Neo. Fifteen years later, there's a new protagonist named Oscar Yu. And by this time, the penalties for losing a match are different. <laughs> yeah, in the original series, to lose a match, to lose the martial arts match, you're automatically disqualified, but then you have to walk off the stage nude. In the future, you get game raped. Yeah. Whoa. Story for another day. <laughs> Whoa. You'll it's, notice it's, it's an, an 18 plus sticker on the front, right. and if you flip the back over, you see the anime titty. So right. you know it's it's that. But that was the wow. that was the fun part of the game in the anime is just like, and and some girls that competed couldn't take it. And they would try to run off the stage before their clothes got ripped off. But it's like, no, walk of shame, you know, villain. Um, yes. She would just snap her fingers and your clothes would just come flying off. <laughs> so my, one of my favorite girls in here Whoa. is a wrestler. Jun Kabuta. Thank you. Is that the one that does the pile driver? Yes. Yes. Oh. The tan skin one, black hair, pile driver girl. And she's just like, well, shit, I lost. All right, screw it, let's go. Like, she was like, here I am. I don't care. And I was just like, I love her. Yes. Wow. It's, it's a fun old school anime. If you're into retro and 90s beautiful artwork, anime style, you, you definitely need to check out the OVAs of Variable Neo. I am definitely a fan. I've been since I was little. But yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. The standard, though, for this, for the standard in the Japanese tournament fighting game community is this particular game here. Yes. Because it has the elements of every Street Fighter and SNK game you can imagine, from safe falls to alpha counters. Mm -hmm. You can cancel normal combos into special moves, into super moves. Mm -hmm. You can connect super moves three different times, like it's the EX series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's every, there's every element that you can imagine all packed into this game done so well on a PS1 disc 
that, you know, the fans still rave from Japan. Can mm -hmm. we get a, another version of the game for modern systems or even make a sequel? Mm -hmm. The series continued to move forward onto the PC where they made the PS2 version of the game for the PC. Right there, that's for XP. This is the Pocket Fighter version called VG Max, which is chibi versions of the characters right there. Wow. I've been a VG fan for so long <laughs> that I've collected <laughs> every game. Oh, now, like, it, it's, it's serious. It's serious. All the way up into the very, very last wow. game to Neo, which wow. takes place 15 years later. So the reason why I collected all the games is wow. because some of these boxes came with limited edition soundtracks yep. that are no longer, that they didn't even sell in the stores. You can't get them at a book off in Japan. Yep. You have to buy the actual mm -hmm. edition box. And so I'm lucky enough to say I have every single Barry Bugino soundtrack. Wow. Now, if I can get Technical Group Laboratory and Giga to sign those pieces. <laughs> oh, man. You know. I, I wish you the best of luck with that. Thank you. So and hopefully hope it happens. One day. I do hope one day again that they bring this game back and really kind of reintroduce themselves to show the Arcana Hearts fans, yeah. the uh, Skull Girls fans, that before they existed, this existed. Mm -hmm. yes. So I wanted to put that out there. Yes. Yeah, I remember you uh, you and Dr. B's uh, matches versus the, the locals over in... Uh, <laughs> Evil Japan 2019. Yeah, oh, yeah. Got, the pile driver took both of you guys out. <laughs> oh, That's man. how I remember that character. I, yeah, that pile. Yeah, oh, my favorite. Oh, yeah, just like Zangief. My mm -hmm. other favorite is like the Shermy type character in this game. She's really cute. Oh, yes, and she, instead of having her bangs fully covered, she just has her eyes closed all the time. But she, I, I loved her idle animation in this game because she would just be dancing. And, and her stage is a club and is really cute and really fun. So I always appreciated like the interesting little quirks they gave the characters in that game. So. And thank is. you. That has been my little segment on the mythological moment, reintroducing shoujo fighting games from the root um, into, to, into today's times for the new generation to understand before the newer games. This is one of the original games that existed back in the 90s and how there is still a fan favorite for this in Japan, and I'm quite sure the Japanese won't let this game die. Mm -hmm. They're still hoping their own people create a new version of this game. So. so now that brings us to the topic of today's discussion. So today's discussion is what are our favorite PC operating systems? Mm. So we can talk about any operating system, something that okay. is personal to you. It could be Unix, Linux, Windows, Apple, Okay. So personally for me, it's always been Windows 98 Second Edition. Mm. It was the most flexible of the time in terms of older video PC games like this. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it was the standard for Voodoo Banshee 3 video cards mm. and Sound Blaster 16 cards, mm. which was known as the best in producing MIDI music for games in Doom and um. other DOS-related games. Nice. Um, honestly, for me, I didn't do too much PC gaming, but um, I will give respects to um, what you call uh, Windows CE, which the Dreamcast actually. These th this was the program that Windows did with Sega to actually start having this platform for their games to be playable on. Mm. And it kind of started the future and pioneered the way for uh, Xbox. Mm -hmm. Because this only went on for a few years with Sega and Windows working together to make this for the Dreamcast and mm -hmm. to have these games on this platform. And then uh, they stopped it after just a couple of years. But then Windows took that and then that kind of really, I mean, if you think about it, paved the way and birthed uh, the Xbox. So even though I didn't do too much PC gaming, you know, I always tried to play Doom at my friend's house and stuff, and that was like about it. But, um, you know, mostly I just used the internet to try and download like a Gundam Wing song that took three hours back in the day or something, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> or like, trying to find artwork scans from illustration books before you could go buy them at like Little Tokyo. <laughs> so that's all I used the computer for back then. But I do give a lot of respects for uh, Windows CE because that's what uh, Dreamcast, a lot of their games actually did run on. True that, and what you just mentioned would also be 
one of the main reasons how Sega got pushed out of the console market when mm. they did that partnership with Microsoft. Sega World Online eventually became Xbox Live. Mm -hmm. yes. How about you, Dr. B? I can't say which Windows version uh, I can relate to the most, but just DOS itself was okay. the most influential thing for me because I played, um, you know, Doom. Wolfenstein 3D, uh, Duke Nukem. Uh, there's this really cheap, cheesy game called Commander Keen I would play. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah, look it up. Commander Keen. It's like a watered-down 8-bit Duke Nukem game, but DOS ran it all. Um, DOS ran a lot of early Star Wars games as well that I really mm. liked and played on the computer. And my dad taught me how to uh, run DOS and use DOS. My dad's a computer engineer. My stepfather is uh, for the Navy, and um, he brought all that home. So he taught me so much just about like how to like build a computer, put the sound card in, put the video card in, like all that stuff I learned at a really early age. Did I retain a lot of it after I became a hip hop video game playing guy? No, <laughs> but, but um, when it comes to being savvy on the computer, I did retain that. Um, and luckily with great friends like Cookie who always update my technological knowledge, um, I'm getting back into running and building my computer better. And thanks to Tone giving me the ultimate system courtesy of Strike First Gaming, um, now I have Skynet in my room. <laughs> I can do all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, and I would say that's my most influential thing is DOS, for sure. You know, outside of the video gaming aspect, which became personal, I think growing up, I had a little connection to DOS because uh, when you had those huge floppy disks, well, it was right when DOS was being created, but those huge floppy disks that were like this mm -hmm. big, mm -hmm. like a huge square, I, I remember playing Oregon Trail on that. Mm -hmm. And I think my most notable game um, in DOS was Mavis Beacon. Mavis Beacon. Oh, yeah, the typing program. Mm. Oh, you know, I, wow. Um, and, and for the longest time, I thought she was a real person. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did I, I really, like, because to this day, no, really, honestly, to this day, Mavis Beacon yeah. was, was pioneering. She was, like, the, the first African-American symbol on a typing program mm -hmm. that came from, like, the late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. This woman is still on the front of the box making new typing programs for the new generation. So it's like an early Siri in a sense. Oh, damn. So she's, she's her essence, her, her, and still the same face, mm -hmm. just updated with an escrow. But she, you know, she, <laughs> she's, still around, she's still alive, but it turns oh. out that she was modeled from this uh, uh, Jamaican lady at a shoe store mm -hmm. that the company wanted to make a typing program, and they wanted huh. to use this African-American, uh, Jamaican, Caribbean model. Mm -hmm. And she said, sure, they paid her a couple of hundred dollars. She went and she posed, she did a couple of pictures, and voila, she's Mavis Beacon, the typing mothering program to teach people how to learn how to type proficiently. And wow. to this day, her program still exists, and she has outlived a lot of programs. Yeah. From the she comes from such a long way, so she was my emotional connection to DOS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, next to Sticky Bear Math, and. A couple of other games that I can't really recall. They need to make like a typing of the dead game with featuring Mavis for video game fans. Did you guys ever play that? Mavis speaking? No, no. Uh, <laughs> it, it, um, it was based off the House of the Dead. It was Typing of the oh, Dead. Oh, I did play Typing of the Dead. Yeah, yeah I played that. Did, did you ever play that? Yeah, no, I did. I, no. <laughs> oh, it was so hard to play. Okay, they had it at Arcade Infinity, and it's not. It was a Japanese. Yeah. keyboard oh no. it was not in english Whoa. so like i'm struggling like this like wait what symbol is that you know like trying to play it I, I can't even remember i think it was just like yeah it had to be and you had to type out japanese words and there were like a few guys who were really good at it at arcade infinity and i just be sitting there being like like damn that's impressive because that's how you shot the characters mm -hmm. every character was a different word uh, and you had to type out that word really fast in order to keep Keep going to the next math level. Math Blaster worked in the same similarity where you had to solve those math equations. Why are you making me remember <laughs> Math Blaster? <laughs> oh my god. That's old school. Please stop. Elementary school. <laughs> wow. Uh, we had Oregon Trail. That was it. We had a broke. Everybody had Oregon Trail. <laughs> Everybody had school. Oregon Trail. They have Oregon Trail now because hey. it's just Oregon Trail. Hey, hey who, who remembers Square One with Math Man? Oh, math man, man, math, math man, man, math man, 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 the tornado chase after him. Oh, oh man. man. That's my fans. Yeah. Do you know about Square One? 
Wow. I'm a time traveler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, time wow. traveler. Back yes. to you in the in the studio. Let's, let's, let's leave it at that. That means you know about Paula Poundstone, then. I know about all that. Who? She, she's a she's a comedian. She's crazy. Oh, okay, okay. She was before Rosie O'Donnell. Oh. But working with the Sesame Street crew. Oh. Wait a minute. Is that the one that wore like the vest? Mm -hmm. And the suit. You know, she you know she came out as a lesbian years later. But she was before Rosie O'Donnell, before Ellen DeGeneres, Paula mm -hmm. Poundstone. Okay, now I know who you're talking about. Mm -hmm. If it's the one with the vest, I have vague memories of that. Okay, I gotcha. All right. The PBS crew of people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Anyways, can we not talk about such old things now? Can we, like, get All right. Talk about old things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My favorite OS. It was not as old as uh, 98. Uh, it was actually uh, Windows 2000. So I learned how to use uh, Windows 2000, and I had a copy of Advanced Server as my uh, home PC. So... I knew how to do all the security configurations, all uh, you know, the file system, uh, you know, uh, tinkering, making sure whoever's on my network, we could, sh you know, share files and grab stuff on my brother's computer really easy. Just very accessible. Uh, uh, it didn't have the best security unless you knew how to tinker with it. I was going to school at the time at Hill College uh, School of Technology where I got my AAS. Uh, so, yeah, so I learned how to use that, uh, and I got into the industry off of Advanced Server, Windows 2000. I know it wasn't the most uh, secure, and down the line it got overran because the updates really didn't you know, match with the malware and everything else that was coming out because there were more, uh, more internet viruses at that time than any other time because everyone had a computer at that time mm. um but that was my that was my my keen history of learning the ins and outs of windows system and especially using the nt file system with, like i said to share files and you know mm. give people access and some people not access just to tinker around with it at home it was, it was fun and uh also for my pc gaming it worked for all my pc uh games and it was the longest running pc without being overran by viruses in a long time Awesome. Mm -hmm. Good okay. stuff. Well, thank you guys. Well, that concludes this session of the Strike First Gaming Show. Does anyone have any closing comments they'd like to say to our audience? Ladies first. I mean, thanks again for joining us, you guys. Um, you're here for the info and the laughs. And um, we're probably going to have to blur some of these boxes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, actually, some of them are actually going to be blurred on the back. Can't tie it up. Right. That's okay. It's okay. We love Japan. Good old Japan. Good old Japan. Good old Japan. I got something to say. Make sure everyone stays tuned to www.strikefirstgaming.com to tune into this show and to check in with all of us. We all got our own player profiles there, a little background, click on the picture and go to our social medias. Back to you in the studio, Cookie. Okay? All right, and thank you for joining us, and we'll see you in the next show. Let's <laughs> go.